And now chapter 24, Deliverance of the Demon Bomasora. The story of Balmasora, how he kidnapped and made captive 16,000 princesses by collecting them from the palaces of various kings, and how he was killed by Krishna, the Supreme Lord of wonderful character, is all described by Shukdev Goswami to King Parikshit in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Generally, the demons are always against the demigods. This demon, Balmasora, having become very powerful, took by force the umbrella from the throne of the demigod Varun. He also took the earrings of Aditi, the mother of the demigods. He conquered a portion of heavenly Mount Meru and occupied the portion known as Mani Parvat. The king of the heavenly planets, Indra, therefore came to Dvorka to complain about Balmasura before Lord Krishna. Hearing this complaint by Indra, the king of heaven, Lord Krishna, accompanied by his wife Satyabhama, immediately started for the abode of Bomasura. Both of them rode on the back of Garuda, who flew them to Pragyotishapura, Bomasura's capital city. To enter the city of Pragyotishapura was not a very easy task, because it was very well fortified. First of all, there were four strongholds guarding the four directions of the city, which was well protected on all sides by formidable military strength. The next boundary was a water canal all around the city, and in addition, the whole city was surrounded by electric wires. The next fortification was of anila, a gaseous substance. After this, there was a network of barbed wiring constructed by a demon of the name Mura. The city appeared well protected, even in terms of today's scientific advancements. When Krishna arrived, he broke all the strongholds to pieces by the strokes of his club and scattered the military strength here and there by the constant onslaught of his arrows. With his celebrated Sudarshan Chakra, he counteracted the electrified boundary, annihilated the channels of water and the gaseous boundary, and cut to pieces the electrified network fabricated by the demon Mora. By the vibration of his conch shell, he broke the hearts of the great fighters and also broke the fighting machines that were there. Similarly, he broke the walls around the city with his invincible club. The vibration of his conch shell sounded like a thunderbolt at the time of the dissolution of the whole cosmic situation. The demon Mora heard the vibration of the conch shell, awakened from his sleep, and personally came out to see what had happened. He had five heads and had long been living within the water. The Mora demon was as brilliant as the sun at the time of the dissolution of the cosmos, and his temper was like the blazing fire. The effulgence of his body was so dazzling that he was difficult to see with open eyes. When he came out, he first took out his trident and began to rush the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The demon Mora, in his onslaught, was like a big snake attacking Garuda. His angry mood was very severe, and he appeared ready to devour the three worlds. First of all, he attacked the carrier of Krishna, Garuda, by whirling his trident, and through his five mouths he began to vibrate sounds like the roaring of a lion. These roaring vibrations spread all over the atmosphere until they extended all over the world and into outer space, up and down and out to the ten directions, rumbling throughout the entire universe.
Lord Krishna saw that the trident of the Mura demon was gradually rushing toward his carrier Garuda. Immediately, by a trick of his hand, he took two arrows and threw them toward the trident, cutting it to pieces. Simultaneously, using many arrows, he pierced the mouths of the demon Mura. When the Mura demon saw himself outmaneuvered by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he immediately began to strike the Lord in great anger with his club. But Lord Krishna, with his own club, broke the club of Mura to pieces before it could reach him. The demon, bereft of his weapon, decided to attack Krishna with his strong arms. But Krishna, with the aid of his Sudarshan Chakra, immediately separated the demon's five heads from his body. The demon then fell into the water just as the peak of a mountain falls into the ocean after being struck by the thunderbolt of Indra. This demon Mora had seven sons named Tamra, Antariksha, Shravan, Vibhavasu, Basu, Nabasvan, and Arun. All of them became puffed up and vengeful because of the death of their father, and to retaliate, they prepared in great anger to fight with Krishna. They equipped themselves with necessary weapons and situated Pitta, another demon, to act as commander in the battle. By the order of Bhamasura, all of them combinedly attacked Krishna. When they came before Lord Krishna, they began to shower him with many kinds of weapons, like swords, clubs, lances, arrows, and tridents. But they did not know that the strength of the Supreme Personality of Godhead is unlimited and invincible. Krishna, with his arrows, cut all the weapons of the men of Bhamasura into pieces, like grains. Krishna then threw his weapons, and Bhamasura's commander-in-chief, Pita, along with his assistants, fell down, their military dress cut off, and their heads, legs, arms, and thighs severed. All of them were sent to the superintendent of death, Yamaraj. Bhamasura was also known as Narakasura, for he happened to be the son of the earth personified. When he saw that all his soldiers, commanders, and fighters were killed on the battlefield by the strokes of the weapons of the personality of Godhead, he became exceedingly angry at the Lord. He then came out of the city with a great number of elephants who had all been born and brought up on the seashore. All of them were highly intoxicated. When they came out, they saw that Lord Krishna and his wife were beautifully situated high in outer space, just like a blackish cloud about the sun, glittering with the light of electricity. The demon Bhamasura immediately released a weapon called Shatagani, by which he could kill hundreds of warriors with one stroke, and all his assistants simultaneously threw their respective weapons at the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Lord Krishna began to counteract all these weapons by releasing his feathered arrows. The result of this fight 
was that all the soldiers and commanders of Balmasura fell to the ground, their arms, legs, and heads being separated from their trunks, and all their horses and elephants also fell with them. In this way, all the weapons released by Bamasura were cut to pieces by the reaction of the Lord's arrows. The Lord was fighting on the back of Garuda, who was also helping the Lord by striking the horses and elephants with his wings and scratching their heads with his nails and sharp beak. The elephants, feeling much pain from Garuda's attack on them, all dispersed from the battlefield. Balmasura alone remained on the battlefield, and he engaged himself in fighting with Krishna. He saw that Krishna's carrier, Garuda, had caused great disturbance to his soldiers and elephants, and in great anger he struck Garuda with all his strength, which defied the strength of a thunderbolt. Fortunately, Garuda was not an ordinary bird, and he felt the strokes given by Balmasura just as a great elephant feels the impact of a garland of flowers. Balmasura thus came to see that none of his tricks would act upon Krishna, and he became aware that all his attempts to kill Krishna would be frustrated. Yet he tried for the last time, taking a trident in his hand to strike him. Krishna was so dexterous that before Balmasura could touch his trident, his head was cut off by the sharp Sudarshan chakra. His head, illuminated by earrings and helmets, fell down on the battlefield. On the occasion of Balmasura's being killed by Lord Krishna, all the demon's relatives screamed in disappointment, and the saintly persons glorified the chivalrous activities of the Lord. Taking this opportunity, the citizens of the heavenly planets showered flowers on the Lord. At this time, the earth personified appeared before Lord Krishna and greeted him with a garland of Vijayanti jewels. She also returned the dazzling earrings of Aditi bedecked with jewels and gold. She also returned the umbrella of Varun along with another valuable jewel which she presented to Krishna. After this, the earth personified began to offer her prayers to Krishna, the supreme personality and master of the world who is always worshipped by exalted demigods. She fell down in obeisances and in great devotional ecstasy began to speak. Let me offer my respectful obeisances unto the Lord, who is always present with four symbols, namely his conch shell, disc, lotus, and club, and who is the Lord of all demigods. Please accept my respectful obeisances unto you. My dear Lord, you are the super soul, and in order to satisfy the aspirations of your devotees, you descend on the earth in your various transcendental incarnations, which are just appropriate to the devotee's worshipful desire. Kindly accept my respectful obeisances. My dear Lord, the lotus flower grows out of your navel, and you are always decorated with a garland of lotus flowers. Your eyes are always spread like the petals of the lotus flower, and therefore they are all pleasing to the eyes of others. Your lotus feet are so soft and delicate that they are always worshipped by your unalloyed devotees, and they pacify their lotus-like hearts. I therefore repeatedly offer my respectful obeisances unto you. You possess all religion, fame, prosperity, knowledge, and renunciation. You are the shelter of all five opulences. Although you are all-pervading, you have appeared as the son of Vasudev. 
Please, therefore, accept my respectful obeisances. You are the original supreme personality of Godhead and the supreme cause of all causes. Only your Lordship is the reservoir of all knowledge. Let me offer my respectful obeisances unto you. Personally, you are unborn. Still, you are the father of the whole cosmic manifestation. You are the reservoir and shelter of all kinds of energies. The manifested appearance of this world is caused by you, and you are both the cause and effect of this cosmic manifestation. Please, therefore, accept my respectful obeisances. My dear Lord, as for the three gods, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, they are also not independent of you. When there is a necessity of creating this cosmic manifestation, you create your passionate appearance of Brahma. And when you want to maintain this cosmic manifestation, you expand yourself as Lord Vishnu, the reservoir of all goodness. Similarly, you appear as Lord Shiva, master of the mode of ignorance, and thus dissolve the whole creation. You always maintain your transcendental position in spite of creating these three modes of material nature. You are never entangled in these modes of nature like ordinary living entities. Actually, my Lord, you are the material nature. You are the father of the universe, and you are the eternal time that has caused the combination of nature and the material creator. Still, you are always transcendental to these material activities. My dear Lord, O Supreme Personality of Godhead, I know that earth, water, fire, air, sky, the five sense objects, mind, the senses, their deities, egotism, as well as the total material energy, everything animate and inanimate in this phenomenal world rests upon you. Since everything is produced of you, nothing can be separate from you. Yet since you are transcendentally situated, nothing material can be identified with your personality. Everything is therefore simultaneously one with you and different from you. And the philosophers who try to separate everything from you are certainly mistaken in their viewpoint. My dear Lord, may I inform you that this boy, whose name is Bhagadatta, is the son of my son, Bhamasura. He has been very much affected by the ghastly situation created by the death of his father and has become very much confused, being afraid of the present situation. I have therefore brought him to surrender unto your lotus feet. I request your lordship to give shelter to this boy and bless him with your lotus feet. I bring him to you so that he may be relieved of the reactions of all the sinful activities of his father. When Lord Krishna heard the prayers of Mother Earth, he immediately assured her of immunity from all fearful situations. He said to Bhagadatta, Don't be afraid. Then he entered the palace of Bhamasura, which was equipped with all kinds of opulences. In the palace of Bhamasura, Lord Krishna saw 16,100 young princesses who had been kidnapped and held captive there. When the princesses saw the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, enter the palace, they immediately became captivated by the beauty of the Lord and prayed for His causeless mercy. Within their minds, they decided to accept Lord Krishna as their husband without hesitation. Each one of them began to pray to Providence that Krishna might become her husband. Sincerely and seriously, they offer their hearts to the lotus feet of Krishna with an unalloyed devotional attitude. As the super soul in everyone's heart, Krishna could understand their uncontaminated desire, and he agreed to accept them as his wives. 
Thus he arranged for suitable dresses and ornaments for them, and each of them, seated on a palanquin, was dispatched to Dwarka city. Krishna also collected unlimited wealth from the palace, along with chariots, horses, jewels, and treasure. He took from the palace fifty white elephants, each with four tusks, and all of them were dispatched to Dvorka. After this incident, Lord Krishna and Satyabhama entered Amaravati, the capital city of the heavenly planet, and they immediately entered the palace of King Indra and his wife, Sachi Devi, who welcomed them. Krishna then presented Indra the earrings of Aditi. When Krishna and Satyabhama were returning from the capital city of Indra, Satyabhama remembered Krishna's promise to give her the plant of the Parijat flower. Taking the opportunity of having come to the heavenly kingdom, she plucked a Parijat plant and kept it on the back of Garuda. Once Narad had taken a Parijat flower and presented it to Krishna's senior wife, Sri Rukmini Devi. On account of this, Satyabhama had developed an inferiority complex. She also wanted a flower from Krishna. Krishna could understand the competitive, womanly nature of his co-wives, and he smiled. He immediately asked Satyabhama, Why are you asking for only one flower? I would like to give you a whole tree of Parijat flowers. Actually, Krishna had purposely taken his wife Satyabhama with him so that she could collect the Parijat with her own hand. But the denizens of the heavenly planet, including Indra, were very irritated. Without their permission, Satyabhama had plucked a Parijat plant which is not to be found on the earth planet. Indra, along with other demigods, offered opposition to Krishna and Satyabhama for taking away the plant. But in order to please his favorite wife, Satyabhama, Krishna became determined and adamant, so there was a fight between the demigods and Krishna. As usual, Krishna came out victorious, and he triumphantly brought the Parijat plant chosen by his wife to this earth planet, to Dvorka. After this, the plant was installed in the palace garden of Satyabhama. On account of this extraordinary tree, the garden house of Satyabhama became extraordinarily beautiful. As the Parijat plant came down to the earthly planet, the fragrance of the flower also came down, and the celestial swans migrated to this earth in search of its fragrance and honey. King Indra's behavior toward Krishna was not very much appreciated by great sages like Shukdev Goswami. Out of his causeless mercy, Krishna had gone to the heavenly kingdom, Amaravati, to present King Indra his mother's earrings, which had been lost to Baumasura and Indra had been very glad to receive them. But when a flower plant from the heavenly kingdom was taken by Krishna, Indra offered to fight with him. This was self-interest on the part of Indra. He offered his prayer, tipping down his head to the lotus feet of Krishna. But as soon as his purpose was served, he became a different creature. That is the way of the dealings of materialistic men. Materialistic men are always interested in their own profit. For this purpose, they can offer any kind of respect to anyone, but when their personal interest is over, they are no longer friends. This selfish nature is not only found among the richer class of men on this planet, but is present even in personalities like Indra and other demigods. Too much wealth makes a man selfish. A selfish man is not prepared to take to Krishna consciousness and is condemned by great devotees like Shukdev Goswami. In other words, possession of too many worldly riches is a disqualification for advancement in Krishna consciousness.
After defeating Indra, Krishna arranged to marry the 16,100 girls brought from the custody of Bhamasura. By expanding himself in 16,100 forms, he simultaneously married them all in different palaces in one auspicious moment. He thus established the truth that Krishna and no one else is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. There is nothing impossible, for Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He is all-powerful, omnipresent, and imperishable, and as such, there is nothing wonderful in this pastime. All the palaces of the more than 16,000 queens of Krishna were full with suitable gardens, furniture, and other paraphernalia, of which there is no parallel in this world. There is no exaggeration in this story from Srimad Bhagavatam. The queens of Krishna were all expansions of the goddess of fortune, Lakshmiji. Krishna used to live with them in different palaces, and he treated them exactly the same way an ordinary man treats his wife. We should always remember that the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, was playing exactly like a human being. Although he showed his extraordinary opulences by simultaneously marrying more than 16,000 wives in more than 16,000 palaces, he behaved with them just like an ordinary man, and he strictly followed the relationship between husband and wife required in ordinary homes. Therefore, it is very difficult to understand the characteristics of the Supreme Brahman, the Personality of Godhead. Even demigods like Brahma are unable to probe into the transcendental pastimes of the Lord. The wives of Krishna were so fortunate that they got the Supreme Personality of Godhead as their husband, although their husband's personality was unknown even to the demigods like Brahma. In their dealings as husband and wife, Krishna and his queens would smile, talk, joke, embrace, and so on, and their conjugal relationship ever increasingly developed. In this way, both Krishna and the queens enjoyed transcendental happiness in their household life. Although each and every queen had thousands of maidservants engaged for her service, the queens were all personally attentive in serving Krishna. Each one of them used to receive Krishna personally when he entered the palace. They engaged in seating him on a nice couch, presenting him with all kinds of worshipable paraphernalia, washing his lotus feet with Ganges water, offering him betel nuts and massaging his legs. In this way, they gave him relief from the fatigue of being away from home. They saw to fanning him nicely, offering him fragrant essential floral oil, decorating him with flower garlands, dressing his hair, asking him to lie down to take rest, bathing him personally, and feeding him palatable dishes. Each queen did all these things herself and did not wait for the maidservants. In other words, Krishna and his different queens displayed on this earth an ideal household life. Thus ends the Bhaktivedanta purport of the second volume, 24th chapter of Krishna, the deliverance of the demon Bhaumasura.